So close, but so far. That is a phrase that can describe a lot of people's relationships with one another. Whether it's your relationship with people or your relationship with God. Because here's the truth. Proximity does not always equal close personal relationship. You could live close to your spouse, but feel completely far from them. You could live close to your friends or your family members, but feel, or in actuality, be completely far away from them. And it's the same thing with God. You can grow up going to church. You can grow up hearing about God. You can grow up being around people that follow God. You can grow up and and be around all these different things that have to do with God, but at the very same time feel and be completely cut off or completely far from Him. Now today we're continuing and actually rebooting our series through the book of Romans called Good News for You. We've already gone through Romans 1 all the way to Romans 8. And today we're picking the series back up and going into Romans chapter 9. Now I'll remind you or catch you up if you're just now kind of getting engaged into this series in Romans. But Romans chapter 1 to 8 is really all about the gospel. It's all about salvation. It's all about what Jesus has done for us. That he died for our sins. He rose again so that we could have peace with God. So that we could have the hope of heaven. So that we could have forgiveness. So we could have all these benefits and blessings that come from Jesus. And it's all a free gift. That's what Romans chapter 1 says. To chapter 8 is all about. And now as we get into Romans chapter 9, as the Apostle Paul continues to write to the church in Rome, what he begins to address is, okay, now that Jesus, we've established all that Jesus has done, and he's done it for everybody, well, what about the people of Israel? What about the Jewish people? Because they were the chosen people in the Old Testament. So now that everybody is able to have salvation through Jesus, well, what, what, about, what about them? Because weren't, weren't they God's chosen people? So what's, what's their role today? Because you see, in Paul's day, what had happened was, although the Jewish people were the chosen people of God in the Old Testament, and they were awaiting a coming Messiah, there were actually prophecies in the Old Testament that there was going to be a coming Savior. Many of the Jewish people in Paul's day rejected Jesus as Savior. They did not see Jesus as the fulfillment of those prophecies. And so Paul begins to address that here in Romans chapter 9. In other words, the people of Israel, they were so close but so far. You see, they were close because they were the chosen people of God. They were the the, the people group that God entrusted with the Ten Commandments, with the prophets, with the covenants. He had entrusted them with so much. In fact, Jesus himself even descended from Abraham, who is the Jew. He He was a Jew. He was the father of faith. And so they were so close to God, but at the same time, they were so far. And so as I talk to you from this title today of So Close But So Far, I want us to just kind of consider three points today. Number one, how we should respond to people that are so close but so far. Number two, why are so many people so close but so far from God? And then thirdly and finally, how God relates to people that are so close but so far. So let's get started. Number one, how should we respond to people in our lives that are so close but so far? Here's how you should respond and relate to them, is your heart should break over their lostness. Your heart should break over their lostness. Let me read to you Romans chapter 9, verse 1 to 5. This is the Apostle Paul writing, and he says, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it. it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs. And from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. So Paul starts off here and he's saying, I have this great anguish. I have this great sorrow in my heart. Why is he sad? Why is his heart in anguish? He says, because I wish that I could actually be cut off from Christ if it meant that my fellow Israelites would come to Christ. You see, Paul, if you'll remember, before he became Paul, he was Saul. And he was not a Christian leader. He was a Christian killer. You see, he believed that Jesus, like many other Jews in his time, was a false messiah. 
And so he was a persecutor of Christians because he thought Christianity was a false religion. And Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. He knocked him on his butt and Jesus revealed himself to Paul and transformed Paul and forgave Paul and sent Paul out as a missionary. And the number one Christian killer became the number one Christian leader. And Paul's life had been completely changed by the love and grace of God. And he's saying, but you know what? Most of my fellow Israelites have not experienced Jesus. And he's saying, so because of that, my heart is in anguish and I would rather me be cut off. I'd rather me go to hell than all of them be lost and not know Jesus. Do you see the the sadness, the intensity of emotion in his heart, what he's trying to express to us here in this letter? This is a serious matter in Paul's heart. He loves his fellow Israelite people. He's saying, I would rather go to hell myself than for them to be cut off from Christ. And my question to you today is, is, do you have that same heart towards the people in your life that are so close, but oh, they're so far? I gotta tell you, There are times in my life where I feel like I'm on fire and I'm just like pursuing people that don't know God and my heart is broken over the fact that they're lost spiritually and I'm I'm praying for them. I'm trying to tell them about Jesus. And I'll be honest with you, there's times in my life where my heart is cold towards it and I'm just, maybe it's just the busyness of my own life or even the busyness of ministry or the busyness of being a dad where I'm not even thinking about the people in my life that don't know God. Now, here's the thing when it comes to your heartbreaking. Because Paul's heart was broken about this. Your heart breaks over what matters the most to you. Okay, if a mother and father lose their child, their firstborn child, they're going to be broken about that. They're going to cry about that. They're going to mourn that loss. In fact, what would be weird is if that happened and a mother and father were not emotional. If somebody lost their child and they weren't emotional, you would think, that's weird. There's something off there. There's something wrong there in their heart. And in the same way, I think that whenever we are not broken about our family members and friends and coworkers and neighbors that are lost and do not know Christ, and if they died today, they would literally be separated from God in all of eternity in hell. I think that when we see people like that in our life and our hearts aren't broken about it, I think what that points to is it points to there's actually something wrong in our heart. There's something wrong in my heart. There's something wrong in your heart when we don't have that attitude of seeing people that are lost spiritually in our lives and our heart isn't broken about it. There's something wrong in us when that is the case. And so here's what your prayer needs to be. Here's what my prayer needs to be. Lord, would you break my heart for what breaks your heart? Lord, would you help me love people so much so that when I see them, I don't see them as a project. I don't see them as people less than me. But Lord, I see them as you see them. I see them as eternal souls that you created and you want relationship with. But without you, they're lost. Without you, they have no hope. You see, as you pray that prayer and as you ask God to change your heart and to fill yourself with his love for people and to see people the way that he sees them, like Paul said in one of his other letters, the love of Christ will compel you you will be compelled to share the good news of Jesus Christ with people. And you'll share it through both your words and your works. Some people, they think it's only sharing the love of Jesus through their works. Well, let me just, I don't want to tell them about Jesus. I don't want to invite them to church. I don't want to, you know, tell them that, you know, they're a sinner and need to be saved. I don't want to tell them about Jesus dying for, you know, their sins on the cross. But I'll just be really nice to them. Like, maybe I'll buy them a meal or You know, I'll do some kind of act of service for them. And that's great. You should do that. But if you only do that and never share the gospel, you never tell them the good news of what Jesus has actually done for them on the cross and in the resurrection. Well, they're not going to think that God is good. They're just going to think you're a good guy or a good girl or a good person. You see, it's works with words. But on the other hand, if you only share words and you only tell them about Jesus, but you never back it up with your actions, and you're a a cold, unloving person, they're just going to say, well, you know, they have the the words, they, they, they have the talk, but they don't have the walk. They don't back it up. And you see, the Christian witness is not just word, it's not just work, it's word and works coming together that's driven from a heart that genuinely cares about other people. And here's the thing, I just want to say this, if you're in this room, or maybe you're watching later online, and you're in here, 
and you're listening to my voice right now and you don't yet have a relationship with Jesus, I want you to know this. My heart towards you is not a heart of judgment. I'm not better than you. My heart for you is this, is my heart breaks for you. And I love you. And I long that you would just know our good God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That you would just know the purpose that he has for your life. That you would just know what it means to have a relationship with him. That you would know what it is like to have hope from him. The peace from him. The self-control. The transformation that he offers for you. Man, my heart breaks for people that do not know the goodness of God and the greatness of God. And my heart for this church, a royal church, our mission is knowing and showing the love of Jesus in the Bay Area and beyond. And my hope and prayer for this church is that all of you would be so filled up with the love of Christ that you showing his love would just flow up out of you. That you would love people so much that when you see them lost, your heart would break for them and it would move you to say something. It would move you to actually do something. So how should we respond to people that are so close but so far? I think like Paul responds to his fellow Israelites, our heart should break over it, and that should move us to action. So then the second question we have to really answer and address is this, is okay, why are so many people in this world so close but so far from God? Why are there so many people that are in that position? Well, this is why. Because many people are not promised people. Many people are just simply not promise people. What do I mean by that? Well, let's read Romans chapter 9, verse 6 to 9. The Apostle Paul continues to write, and he says, It is not as though God's word had failed. For not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, But it is the children of what? The children of the promise, who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this is how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return, and Sarah will have a son. So, the Apostle Paul has already addressed in the former verses that I read to you, that his heart is broken over the fact that many Israelites are spiritually lost. They have not repented and recognized Jesus as the Messiah. And so now he begins to address a very natural question that flows out of that, which is this. Did God's word fail? Because, okay, you're saying that many of the Israelites are spiritually lost, Paul. You're saying that they don't know God. They don't have a relationship with God. They've rejected the Messiah. They've rejected the Savior of the world. So are you saying God's word failed? Because didn't the Old Testament scriptures say that the Israelites were the chosen people of God? So did God lie? Has Has he failed his people? And so he begins to answer that question and actually clarify what it actually meant for the people of Israel to be the chosen people of God. You see, over the centuries, as the Old Testament scriptures were written and after they had been written, there became this misconception that to be an Israelite meant that you were a child of God. But that actually was never the case. Because as Paul clarifies here, he's saying it's not people of physical descent that are Abraham's offspring, but it is the people of the promise that are the children of God. Which is why he also says, not all that are of Israel are actually true Israelites. In other words, what he's saying is, the true children of God, the true people of God, are not people from physical descent, but people that believe the promise in the same way that Abraham believed the promise. And you see, it's not of physical descent, but people of the promise, which means this for you. Just because you grew up in a Christian home, Just because you grew up in a Christian culture, just because you grew up with Christian siblings, just because you grew up in church, does not mean you are a Christian. It is not by physical descent, but it is by believing the promise. You know, when you're born, you inherit a lot of uh, genes from your mother and from your father. So as you grow up, people might say, oh, you know, your smile, it looks just like your dad. Or your ears look just like your mom. Or your hair, it's wavy, it's curly, just like your dad. Why? Because they've passed on some of their genetics to you, and so you look a little bit like them. But you see, the same cannot be said for faith. A mother and a father, a brother or a sister, or a mentor, or whomever, or a culture that you are surrounded by, cannot genetically pass the faith of Jesus to you. You have to make the faith decision yourself. Every single person has to believe the promise themselves. They have to place their faith in Jesus themselves. 
It's not by physical descent, he says. It's by believing the promise. And notice he says it's by believing the promise. It's not by working your way into God's family. You can't work your way into God's family by being a good person, by trying really hard to polish who you are and to show up to church and put on a good religious show. No, 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 no. That's not how you get into heaven. That's not how you get into relationship with God. It's not by works that you are saved. It's by grace through faith. It's by believing in the promise just as Abraham believed in the promise. Now, what does that mean? Abraham believed in the promise. Well, let's go a little bit deeper into that because it's referenced here in Romans 9. But Paul in Romans 4 already talked about this, about Abraham believing in the promise. So let me read it to you. Romans 4, verse 20 to 25. He says, Yet he, he's talking about Abraham, did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. And the words that was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Now, if you'll remember, or maybe I'll share with you for the first time, in Genesis, when God promises Abraham, he promises Abraham that he will be a blessing to all the nations. And the way he will be a blessing to all the nations of the world is that he is going to bring this incredible nation that will descend out from him. Now, here's what's so crazy about that promise. God gave Abraham that promise when, one, he didn't have any kids yet, and two, he was super old. So it sounds like kind of a weird promise. But yet in faith, Abraham defying logic, believed the promise of God. He believed that God had the power to fulfill the promise. And I just want to say this as a side note today. God has the power to fulfill the promises that he's placed on your life. All of God's promises are yes in Jesus Christ. And so God gave Abraham the promise. Abraham believed the promise. And we are told that because of that, God credited righteousness to him. And that that promise was just not for Abraham, but it was for you and for me. That for all who believe God's promise, what's the promise? That Jesus Christ died on the cross in your place for your sins and rose again three days later so you could be a child of God. If you believe that promise, here's what will happen. God credits Christ's righteousness to you. Which means when God looks at you, he doesn't look at you through the lens of your sin. He looks at you through the lens of your Savior. He looks at you as if you've never sinned before. Which means when you look at yourself in the mirror, you're looking at a new you if you're in Christ. It means that you are no longer defined by your failure. Failure is not final. You are not defined by your past sin. You are not defined by your past addictions. You are not defined by what somebody has done to you. You are not defined by any failure or flaw or any way that you've ever fallen in your life. You are defined by the perfect righteousness of Christ. That you are robed in his righteousness. That when you believe in the promise of God, you are no longer clothed in the rags of your rebellion against Christ. You are clothed in the robe of Christ's righteousness. You have a new identity in Christ when you, by faith, come to Christ and you believe in his promise. And that's how you become a child of God. It's by believing the promise. And that's why so many people are so close but so far. Because they have not yet believed the promise. I want us at Arroyo Church to be promised people. Come on, are there any promised people in the room today? I believe his promises. I believe that he's good. I believe that in him I have a hope of heaven. I believe in him that all things work together for good. I believe that all of his promises are kept because he's faithful and he's powerful and able to keep and to do what he says he's going to do. So how should we respond to people that are so close but so far? Our hearts should break over it. Why are so many people so close but so far? Well, because they're not promised people yet. 
But then thirdly and finally, and actually most importantly, and I will say this as a side note as well, most confusingly, this passage I'm about to read to you is really deep. (laughs) But I'm going to bring clarity, so don't worry. But how does God respond to, how does God relate to people that are so close but so far in their spiritual lives? Well, let's look at it. This, this is how he does it. Is he, he's, he's, he's merciful when your heart is moldable. People that are so close but so far, people that are struggling, people that have run away, people that have been following Jesus for years, I want you to know this. When your heart is moldable, he is merciful. Okay, let me read this passage. Like I said, this is a long passage, and it has a lot here, but just be patient. We're going to break it down. Romans nine sixteen to 24. The Apostle Paul continues to write, and he says, It does not, therefore, depend on human desire or effort, but, what? On God's mercy. For Scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. Now one of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? What if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared and advanced for glory, even us, whom he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles? So the way that God saves people, the way that God meets people, the way that God touches people's lives that are so close but also so far from him is this. It's really quite clear. His mercy. The way God meets you when you are at your lowest or when you are at your farthest from him is he meets you, come on somebody, with mercy. Now what's mercy? Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. What do we deserve because of our sins? Right? Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So that means you Me and everybody in this room and everybody on this earth, we've all sinned, we've all fallen short, we've all turned against God, and the result of that is we deserve separation from God now and separation from Him for all of eternity. But here's what mercy is. It's God not giving you the punishment that you deserve for your sins. Mercy is God's unearned love in your life. It's the fact that he loves you, not because of who you are, but because of who he is. The Bible says that God is love. Love is not just what God does. Love is not just how he treats us. Love is who he is. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of grace. He's a God of love. He's a God of patience. That's how he meets you. When you are in the middle of your mess, when you are in the middle of your sin, when you are in the middle of being so close but so far from him, he meets you with mercy. But then the passage goes on here in Romans chapter 9. And it gets really deep and maybe confusing to some of you as I was reading it. Okay, so if he meets us with mercy and it's not dependent on human desire and it's not dependent on human will it's solely dependent on the mercy of god that is how we are saved then does that mean that there's no human will involved does that mean that you know god just chooses in his mercy to save some and then you know for other people it's just like nah i'm not going to save you so some are in some are out and god just kind of determines it beforehand and that's it is that what this passage is teaching That's what some people think this passage is teaching. In fact, a lot of people think that that's what this passage is teaching, that this passage is teaching teaching determinism, or as some would call it, Calvinism. And if you get into some of the theological debates, there's some, you know, theological debates between some people that would call themselves, you know, Calvinists, and some people would be Arminians, and, you know, I'm not going to get into fully all the weeds of that. But the question here that I want to kind of answer real briefly here is, is that what this passage is teaching? Is it teaching determinism? And actually, I would say, It's actually not. I think what it's actually teaching is that when our heart is moldable, God is actually 
merciful to us. Now, let me share with you three reasons why I think that is. Number one, I think that determinism actually goes against from what the rest of Scripture teaches. But then number two, we see that God doesn't necessarily determine people's hearts to be hard, but he actually hardens hearts that are already hard. And then thirdly, we see that he mercifully molds us into masterpieces when our hearts are moldable. So there's a lot there. So let me just break it down. The first one, we're going to go to a passage outside of Romans 9, and then the other two points are inside of Romans 9. So let me just read you 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 to 5. It says this. This is also the Apostle Paul writing. He says, God wants everyone to be saved and to fully understand the truth. There is only one God and there is only one way that people can reach God. The way is through Jesus Christ. So pretty clear there. Jesus is the way to salvation. It's not Buddha. It's not Muhammad. It's not Mormonism. It's not materialism. It's not atheism. It's not religion, being a good person. Jesus Christ is the way, the only way to salvation. But here's the good news. God is a loving God, and he desires some people to be saved. What does it say? He desires all people to be saved. Just like John 3.16 says, God so loved the world. So God loves everybody. God wants everybody to be saved. So if you believe that Romans 9 is teaching determinism, that God decides who's in and who's out at uh, the beginning of time or even before the beginning of time, well, you have to look at other verses like John 3, 16 and then here in 1 Timothy and say, well, if God's a determinist and he loves everybody, then that means everybody's saved. But the bottom line is it's not true. I mean, you look all throughout Scripture and Jesus constantly warns of judgment. He constantly says, hey, at the end of the ages, there's going to be people that are going to be separated based off of how they've responded to me, if they've placed their faith in me or not. Jesus is like, listen, some people are going to be with me forever in heaven. Some people are going to be separated from me forever. So I think that Romans 9 isn't teaching determinism because the Bible is very clear that God loves everybody and he wants everybody to come to a knowledge of the truth. Now let's go back into Romans 9, though. Because in Romans 9 also mentions Pharaoh. And there's this line about Pharaoh, and and in that context where it says, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. Now some people, that's kind of one of their strongest passages for trying to kind of preach Calvinism and some form of determinism, where it's like, see, there it is. God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. So see, there it is. Before time even begins, God's going to decide, okay, this person, I'm going to make sure they have a hard heart, and they're not going to follow me, they're not going to have a relationship with me, and then here are some people that, in my mercy, I'm going to save, and that's just, it is what it is. Now, if you just read that verse in isolation, that interpretation might make sense. But you have to read that verse within the context of the story of which it's being taken out of. So go back to Exodus, where we're told about Pharaoh. Who's Pharaoh in the Old Testament in Exodus? Well, he's the leader of Egypt, who at the time, they were um, keeping the Israelites as captives and as slaves. And God raises up a leader, Moses, and he says, Moses, I want you to lead the people of Israel out of captivity, out of slavery, and into the promised land. And so Moses, he tells Pharaoh, he says, let my people go. And there's this strife, there's this conflict between Moses and Pharaoh, and Pharaoh and God. And within that story in Exodus, watch this, this is crazy. 20 times the phrase, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, occurs. 20 times. And you want to know this? Out of those 20 times, 10 of those times, it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. The other 10 times, it says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. So here's what this passage is actually teaching here. It's teaching this. That yes, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. Who does God harden? What are the type of people that God hardens? People that already have hardened themselves. Here's the danger of the judgment of God on your life, and in anybody's life, is that if you continually harden your heart over and over and over again, there comes a point in your life where God says, okay, clearly that's what you want. Have it your way. And he lets you have what your sinful desires want. You see, this passage is not teaching that God just says, okay, you know, I'll have mercy on some and then I'll harden others. No, God's heart is he loves everybody. He wants to have mercy for everybody. He wants to give grace and forgiveness to everybody. But there comes a line, and I don't know where the line is, but there comes a line in your life where you cross that and God just says, okay, you've crossed the line. You've already hardened your heart many times. 
And now I'm going to harden it a little further. And I'm going to find a way. And here's the incredible thing about God is God finds a way, even though you don't have a relationship with him or somebody doesn't have a relationship with them in the moment he hardens their heart, he still works that together for good for his glory somehow, some way. That's just how incredible he is. That he doesn't just use Christians for his glory. He even uses non-Christians or even terrible people for his glory. He works all things, all people together for his glory, which is incredible. But here's the other thing that kind of follows that verse, and Paul actually kind of, as he naturally does in a lot of his writings, is he brings up the story of Pharaoh and, you know, how he, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. He kind of anticipates a rhetorical question, so he answers it. The rhetorical question is this, well, then why would God blame us? So if he has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy and he hardens whom he wants to harden, then why would God blame us for our behavior? Why would God blame us or, 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 or keep us responsible for our eternal destination? And I love the answer here that Paul writes because it's so similar to many of the times where people ask God the why question or they ask God a really big question. The answer is this. Why do you, as, as the clay, think that you have the right to question the potter? So he's the potter, you're the clay. You as the clay, why do you think, like you're asking all these big questions to God, don't you know that God is so much bigger and greater than you and you'll never fully understand everything? You'll never fully wrap your head around why he does what he does and when he does it and all those things? Humble yourself before the Lord. Realize there are some aspects of what he does and doesn't do that you won't understand. Who are you as a mere human being, as a mere mortal, to even ask God the question or think that you could even begin to fully understand all of his ways and all of his workings? But even this passage, too, going back to this idea of, is this passage teaching Calvinism or determinism? What's really interesting here is this, too, these verses I just kind of quoted to you and read to you also can be an argument for some people to kind of, argue for Calvinism or determinism because they say, okay, see, there it is right there, right? God hardens who he wants to harden. He has mercy on whom he wants to have mer mercy. And we're just not supposed to question it because, you know, he's the potter and we're the clay. But again, you have to go back into the context. What is he quoting here? He's actually quoting Old Testament scriptures when he says that God's the potter and we're the clay. He's quoting scriptures from Isaiah. He's also quoting scriptures from Jeremiah. In fact, let me read to you Jeremiah 18, verse 6 to 10. He's talking about the people of Israel here. God speaking to the prophet Jeremiah. He says, Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I had intended to do for it. So do you see that this is actually the exact opposite of Calvinism? Because what he's saying is, is yeah, you're the clay, I'm the potter. Now, I, if I'm planning to do good to somebody, but then they completely rebel and turn their back on me, I might reconsider that. But he's like, but if I'm planning judgment or destruction for somebody, but they repent and they turn from their ways and turn to me, then I might reconsider that. And so the idea of he's the potter and we're a clay, it's merely an illustration. It's not meant to be taken out too far to mean something it doesn't. Really what the bottom line here and what God is trying to, I believe, teach us through this passage is that when your heart is moldable, God can turn you into a masterpiece. But when your heart is not moldable, you will meet the consequences for that. Let me say it again. When your heart is moldable, God could shape you into a beautiful masterpiece. But when your heart is not moldable, when it is hard, when it is obstinate, when it is stubborn, when it is thick-headed, when it does not listen to God, when it does not listen to God's word, when it does not listen to God's people, God cannot use people like that. God cannot save people like that. You know, one of the things my daughter, Ariella, loves to play with is Play-Doh. Anybody, like, still as an adult love Play-Doh a little bit? I don't know. I, you know, we've been playing with it a little bit, and Play-Doh's kind of fun. I'm not going to lie. Now, here's the thing with Play-Doh. You can make all sorts of incredible things with it. When it's, it's soft and it's moldable, you can build things and create things, and it's incredible. 
But you know what happens if you leave it out overnight and you don't put it back in its container? Over a long period of time, it gets really gross. It gets hard and crusty, and it's not really moldable anymore. And what God is saying is he's saying, if you would keep your heart soft before me, if you would allow your heart to be moldable, I'll take that clay, and as the potter, I will mold your heart into a masterpiece, and you will become a person that exhibits the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. You'll become more like Jesus. You'll begin, begin to do great things for God's glory and other people's good. When you keep your heart moldable, when you keep it soft before him, but when you harden your heart, when you, when you put your hands over your ears to not listen to God's voice and the voices that God has put into your life, when you do that, you actually exclude yourself. God's not excluding you. You're actually excluding yourself at worst to God's family and at best from enjoying the fullness that he has for you and his perfect plan for you. And I just want you to know this. I want to be really upfront. God does not require perfection from you. But what he does require is pliability. God does not expect you to be perfect in this life. He does not expect you to bat a thousand. He does not expect you to always do and to always say the right thing. But here's what he does expect you to do. To not be perfect, but to have a heart that's pliable. To say, Lord, I'm willing to be flexible to you. I'm willing to have a soft heart towards you. I'm willing to say that I am wrong, you're right, and to repent and to turn from my wrong ways and to turn to you and to follow you. So many people in this world, maybe even some people in this room, are so close to God, but yet at the same time, so very far. And here's what I've realized, not only from Scripture, but from experience and seeing people's lives being changed by Jesus. The only way a hard heart can be softened is through the love of Christ. You know, when a piece of clay has become really hard and it's no longer moldable and it can't be used or fashioned by an artist and can't be used in such a way to actually be moldable so it can be made into a masterpiece, you know what's one of the ways that clay can actually be softened? If you subject it to heat, it can no longer, it will no longer be hard, but it actually can become soft again and moldable again. And you see, it is through the warmth of the love of Christ that God can meet the hardest hearts and melt them to being soft again and mold them into being masterpieces. And where is the love of Christ seen most clearly? Well, look at the cross, because on the cross, Jesus said this. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in that moment, Jesus was made far from the Father. He was separated from the Father. Why? Because he was taking on your sin on his shoulders. And in that moment, he was far from the Father. And the reason why Jesus was far from the Father was because he wanted you to place your faith in him. Because if you place your faith in him, you will no longer be far from the Father. You will be brought close to the Father. You will have peace with the Father. You will no longer be so close but so far from him. But you will be brought near to him through the blood of Christ if you've placed your faith in the promise. So today, if you're here and you've never placed your faith in the promise that is found in Jesus Christ, maybe you've been running from God. Maybe you've even been hardening your heart. But maybe as I've been speaking today through the word, the Holy Spirit has been softening your heart. He's been opening your heart. Today is your chance. Don't close the door. Don't further harden your heart. This might be your last time, your last opportunity to accept Christ. Today, if Jesus has been knocking on the door of your heart, if the Holy Spirit has been softening your heart, do not harden it again yourself. Let him in. Place your faith in him. And as you do that, he will change your life. If you're here and you've already let Jesus into your heart, you've already let him soften your heart. Listen, as a Christian, don't be deceived. You can begin, even as a Christian, to harden your heart to the Lord and his people. Today, come before him humbly. Soften your heart before him. Open, with open hands, Lord Jesus, I give you my heart. Help me to see myself as you see me. Help me to see my life as you want me to see my life. Soften your heart before the Lord. Allow your heart to be broken for others that haven't yet had their heart changed by Jesus. As you look to the love of Christ, he will soften our hard hearts. He will take our hearts of stone and make them into hearts of flesh. As, as he changes our hearts, he will change our lives. Let's pray. And if you're here today and maybe you're honest, 
and uh, you've never really let Jesus into your heart. Maybe your heart's been kind of hardened against him. But today, maybe it's a coming back. You're a child of God, but it's coming back. Or maybe it's coming into the family for the first time, placing your faith in him for the first time. But if you're here today and you just want to pray a prayer of just softening your heart before the Lord, if you could pray something like this, Lord Jesus, forgive me for the times in my life where my heart has been hard towards you. Forgive me for the times where I didn't just run down the road once, but I run down that road several times. Lord, today I'm looking to your love and the fact that even in those moments you died for me, you rose again for me. And Lord, today I'm coming back to you and I'm asking you to not just soften my heart today, but every day for the rest of my life so that I might live fully for you. It's in Christ's name.